Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our day to confront racism with our student panel. My name is Felicia Lanquist. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am excited to be here to uh, introduce you to our students and our fearless leader, Dr. Stephanie Logan, who will also moderate this, this panel discussion today. So I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Logan, and then we will hand it over to our students to do introductions. All right, my name is Dr. Stephanie Logan. I'm the chair of the education department here at Springfield College. And we see we have folks uh, coming in. It's good to see so many folks in the room. So I'm going to highlight or share the purpose of this session and just talk about maybe just a couple few community norms as we gather here um, to uh, listen to our students. And then our students will uh, share their name, their major, their year here at Springfield College and any additional bit of information they deem necessary for you all to know about them. So uh, one wanting to uh, recognize that this particular event is a part of the day um, that has been um, planned in conjunction with the Springfield College Legacy Alumni of, a, of Color. The Springfield College community has set aside again this particular day to confront racism. And hopefully you all took advantage of listening to the scholars that presented earlier um, on racism, power, privilege, and prejudice. Um, and we hope that you come back at seven um, to hear um, Ibram Kendi um, talk about his work um, for uh, moving and operating in the world um, in an anti-racist uh, manner perspective. But for this time that we are together, a voice that we absolutely need to hear from. We can hear from scholars. It's great to hear from alumni, but let's hear from folks who are on the ground, who are here um, as undergraduate and graduate students um, and, and colleagues. Let's hear from you know, our students. Let's hear and uplift their voice at this particular time. So um, I'll let you all introduce yourselves and whomever wants to go first, feel free. My name is Ocean Eversley. I'm a second year MSW student at Springfield College. I can go. My name is Brianna DeHaiti. I'm a junior here at Springfield College. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a criminal justice and computer science major and a leader in the Office of Multicultural Affairs. I'll hop in next. Um, my name is Nora Fitzgerald. I'm a junior as well. I'm a psychology major with a minor in sociology. And um, um, yeah, I'm excited to be here today with all, all of you. Hi, my name is Molly Coates. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm a junior here at Springfield College in the history and secondary education programs. And I am a part of various clubs on campus. My name is Paris Lozana. I'm a sophomore sports management student and I am the co-VP of the Women of Power Club and I use she, her, her pronouns. Hi, my name is Shannon Fields. I'm a graduate student in the industrial slash organizational psychology program. This is my last semester. Um, one important thing to know about me is that I'm constantly and continually learning um, about social justice and equity and always trying to understand the complexities within oppression. And I like to share as I learn. Hi, my name is Lexi Blake. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers. I'm a digital web and multimedia design major. I'm a junior at Springfield College, and among other roles on campus, I serve as the president of the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Awesome. Uh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so, so um, much. I do want to um, just, you know, put out there our um, sort of, you know, ground rules or uh, ways that we will engage. There will be an opportunity for you as participants to ask some questions, to pose some questions for discussion um, at the end. So feel free to use your chat, feel free, feel free to use the question and answer um, section, and we will certainly raise those with our panelists. Um, let's be respectful in the comments, um, number one, um, and, and sort of also with that, let's be respectful towards our panelists each and every one is an expert on themselves and they do not speak for their entire groups 
They speak for themselves and their experience as members of various groups. So let's recognize that each of them reflects various aspects of identity and some of those identity overlap, interlock and operate together. And some of them, they sort of uh, experience singularly, but nevertheless, they are all experts on their experience and we are looking forward to hearing from them. Um, and I guess the third thing, it, you know, that goes along with respecting, you know, the folks who are panelists um, and recognizing that they are sharing their stories, let's honor their stories. Stories are powerful and stories can be very transformational. So let's honor, um, you know, what it is that they will share with us today um, from their particular perspective. So I will turn things over to my uh, prestigious co-host. So much, Dr. Logan. <clears throat> and also, I just want to share that we will have one more student, Sabrina, uh, will be joining us, who is the uh, trustee elect. Um, and so we'll just to give an FYI. Uh, we'll start off with our first question, and I open up to any of our students who want to answer this. From your perspective, what keeps Springfield College students of European ancestry or white students from truly listening to their BIPOC, and for folks that are unaware what BIPOC stands for, Black, Indigenous, people of color, colleagues, and believing their experiences with racism on campus? I'll jump in on this one. So um, as a white student on campus, I feel like some of my white counterparts may be um, in general, if they don't see it for themselves, they don't necessarily know that the issue exists. And so part of that is also making sure that you're listening to your fellow students and trusting what they're telling you. Um, I think that's one of the most important parts. And also not letting your first instinct be to make an excuse for the school or to find some way around the issue. Um, I think really this is a time for white students like myself to sit back and like listen and try to really digest what people of color are saying to us and what's going on on campus. Yeah, kind of bouncing off of that, I think right now we're in a world that is shut down. We're in a largely bubbled off situation where we socialize with only four to six people, whatever CDC says that week. Um, and we're living in a world in which we are focused on getting through the next day. And we're focused on how many hours we're spending on Zoom, as opposed to what we can be doing to make sure that our community is open not necessarily to a disease, but open to making change, that's important. And I think that's been difficult addressing COVID-19 in the same time frame. Yeah, I'll add to that. So this question, I like this question because, you know, when, when it comes to answering um, questions like this, it, it appeals to our humanity. So usually people, they're thinking of things, they think of what's in their best interest. So like if you were pertaining this to, to an example like voting, um, usually when people vote, they're thinking about what's best for me, what's best for my family. So they're gonna vote and cast their vote that way. But to relate that to like in general, you're usually thinking of what's in your best interest. And I think um, if we were able to think more about people outside of us and what's best for everyone, what, who, what's best for everyone who's in this Springfield College environment, then we'd better be able to see the things that um, people of color face here on campus and outside in the real world. So I think it's just a question of humility. Um, if, if you want to be a good ally to BIPOC individuals, it's just important to surround yourself with people who don't look like you. Once you step out of that boundary of hanging out or interacting with only people who look like you, you'll, you'll find that there are people that have different experiences and you'll be able to relate to them better, you'll be able to connect to them better, and you'll be a better ally in the long run. I think too, such an important piece of this is just understanding privilege and understanding that, like if you don't grow up with the exposure to these types of issues, then you're gonna have to consciously make a choice to educate yourself. And that's a step that when you don't need to take it, not everyone will. I mean, like I know people who have come through Springfield College, alumni who have told me that they did not even realize that there was a problem. And it was because of their privilege. And I know too that like because of my privilege and because of any white presenting students privilege, you know, like I could have come that same way. 
but it was the people around me growing up and because of my decision to expose myself and to take part in educational opportunities, I've kind of developed that lens where I can notice these issues and I'm pulled to help in as many ways I, as I can. I, I, I really do think that kind of leads into that question about um, what does like really being an ally mean? And I, I wrote something down, so I'm just going to write it, you know, read it. I wrote, being an ally is more than being sympathetic towards those who experience discrimination. It is more than simply believing in equality. Being an ally means being willing to act with and for others in pursuit of ending oppression and creating equality. It means supporting marginalized people by lending privilege and resources to pursuing social justice. Instead of trying to lead the charge toward equality themselves, white people can evaluate the voices and needs of people of color by decentering their own voices and creating space for others to have power, resources, and affirmation. Thank you so much, Ocean, for, um, for actually bringing us to our next question. Um, I do want to give a moment and take space to introduce Sabrina Williams. I'm going to hand that over. Sabrina, if you can tell us who you are, year, major, uh, that'd be greatly appreciated. Hi, everyone. I'm Sabrina Williams. Um, I'm a third year student at Springfield studying sociology and English. Um, I'm the student trustee elect and I'm the president for Women of Power. So much, Sabrina. And yeah, we'll get we'll go right back into that question that Ocean so greatly and graciously opened up, which is what does it take or what what makes someone a good ally, or I will even say accomplice? Yeah, I, I will also Ocean. add co-conspirator to that then, you know, and that might be a necessary conversation. My apologies, Nora, for, for cutting you off, but you know, there is a difference between an ally, between an accomplice, and between a co-conspirator. But nevertheless, uh, we want to hear from you all. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I was just gonna say Ocean kind of touched on it. Um, like as a white person, this is not my space to tell people of color what they do or do not need. This is my opportunity to make room for other people and give them the tools that I can provide so that they can advocate for themselves and so that I can support them. So I guess my main thing as an ally, I think as a white person, we should just take this step back. Um, don't, don't try to insert yourself into the situation um, and to really just try to humble yourself and know that you're just going to keep learning as you go and that you should lean on your, your people of color around you or your students of color around you to, um, to really not necessarily educate you, but to lead the way in, in the progress that we're making on campus. I would like to um, jump in. I think what it takes to be a good ally is a need to see a problem as your personal problem and not your friend's problem or your relative's problem, because when you frame it as your own problem, you're going to respond to a situation differently and you're going to continue your fight no matter the actions of individuals that you may or may not agree with. And I will say going off of that, that while I feel like there's a lot of value in stepping back and Ocean, as you so awesomely put, decentralizing the like impact of privilege that we have, I do feel that, especially when it comes to Paris, what you brought up with voting, I do feel like that there is a space for us to use education to influence the future through voting. And I think that's a crucial aspect that when we look at activism in general, is an, an avenue that we all need to understand why it's so important and that we should be taking it. We can use our vote in so many different ways at such a local level to community-based level to college level and into state and federal levels. That I think that the education surrounding voter rights is so linked to how we can better step into understanding equality and understanding racial injustices that are currently happening in the United States. Yeah, to go off, to go off of that, I, I really think part of being a good ally is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes without becoming the shoes yourself. It's important for you to be able to understand and empathize with people of color and their experiences without taking on saying that I'm a person of color and this is what I've, what I've experienced. Um, there's, there's a big difference between those two. But um, like, like um, Molly was saying, um, when 
there's a lot of issues of injustice, things that um, BIPOC individuals are facing. Um, those may be policies, that may be um, just interactions with people who, who don't see them um, equally. There's a lot of things you can do as allies, such as calling it out. If you see your friends doing it, you should always say something, um, say, hey, that's not cool. Um, you, you just need to treat everyone with respect. Um, if it's your vote, then it's voting for um, equalize, making equal policies um, that treat BIPOC individuals just um, as fairly as anyone else. I think such an important piece of that too is that understanding of, you know, no matter whose story you hear as a white presenting individual, no matter what articles you read, you could study it for years, but you're never going to truly understand, you know, what those experiences are like. And that's okay. That's part of being an ally and accepting that's part of being an ally. And I feel like an ally will always use their voices to, to speak up for your BIPOC peers, but not over them. Instead, it's with it's not for, it's not, it's with. <laughs> Lexi, I think that's a really good point too, because I think that um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the term like white savior complex. Um, and that's an important thing to stay away from because we don't want to overstep and treat this as I'm going to save the day and I'm doing all of this to help. Um, it's, it's a team effort. We really all need to, you know, group together um, and understand each other and work with each other and just continue that process. I like to add that going on what you just said too, it's, it's not enough to be a non-racist, right? We have to be an anti-racist. So you can say, well, you know, I have Puerto Rican friends or black friends, but what are you doing? You know, you, you know, what are you doing? Are you, are you implementing any changes? Are you fighting against the systemic racist structures, right? Are you speaking truth to your friends, you know, like, what are you actually doing? Or are you just a non-racist bystander, which in itself right there is racist, you know, because you are, if you're not an anti-racist, you are actively taking advantage of the racist structures. So being an ally is being an anti-racist, right? Or anti-isist, you know, ism, you know, whatever that is, right? A ableism, sexism, you know, all these isms. So it's, it's you're either working towards the problem or you, you know, unfortunately are the problem, right? So let's go ahead and transition into the next question. So allyship may be a key necessary step for this campus um, to reduce racial injustice. But what are some other um, ideas or thoughts of around how on Springfield on the Springfield College campus um, we can reduce racial injustice? I could take this question. So to reduce racial injustice on campus, I think dealing with the problem head on and not acting like oh it's not there. I, since I'm not talking about it, I don't see it, it's not a problem. No, we need to face it head on. Like for example, if one of your friends says something that's racist or ignorant or something like that, like actually correct them and say that they're wrong and don't be afraid that, oh, they won't like me after because at the end of the day, it's part of a bigger problem and you're not gonna like your friend down the line if they keep saying racist and ignorant, things like that. So taking the problem head on, no matter if it's your friend or if you're walking by someone on the sidewalk, like don't be afraid to correct them because the problem is there. And if we act like it's not, it's just gonna become a bigger problem. So correct them, like if you want, give them the tools that they need to go educate themselves, show them why they're wrong but like keep actively proving people wrong, calling people out and dealing with the problem head on. I think going off of that is that we need to shift away from how we've used performative ideas of activism and how we've used our social media to display an image of ourselves that we want to see and time to step into that role of actually holding up those actions that show yourself as an anti-racist opposed to a bystander. 
because even if we use social media to post this, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't mean that you're stepping into actions. And I think Brianna said it perfectly that we need to open our minds is step number one for like different ways that we can do this. Open your mind to understand that there are different perspectives and that your perspective can be wrong because it's okay if you're wrong, as long as you work to like understand the differences. And I think from opening your mind, you can go to education very easily and just taking on different roles day by day, step by step, you can learn more about different topics and you can learn how to be that person that we see on the other end of social media, that we see act being an activist and being an anti-racist. I think the biggest problem as a person of color on campus that I've noticed is that people are more afraid of being viewed as a racist than they are about being an anti-racist, um, which I think is what keeps the problem circulating. So I think if we integrated anti-racist um, ideologies in the classroom, um, you know, on campus activities and stuff like that, if we keep it, you know, a continuous conversation, it doesn't have to be like, you know, the, you know, for lack of a better word, the black clubs on campus shouldn't be the only people advocating for these types of things. Um, I think teachers can find ways to talk about this type of stuff in the classroom. Um, like we're gonna go out into the, you know, the real world. We, we do live in some sort of bubble when we're in college, but we're gonna go into the real world and we're gonna meet all different types of people. And if we pretend that we're not gonna meet, um, you know, people that are completely different from us when we go into the real world, we're never going to be prepared. And that's what, we're paying thousands of dollars to do. We're, we're trying to be as prepared as possible. So I think um, making it um, an anti-racist campus everywhere, not just, you know, expecting the clubs with the most um, people of color to do the work for you. Going off of what Sabrina said, I think that there are many injustices that are interwoven within each other and fighting in silos isn't going to necessarily get the results that you need to actually fight against what you are fighting against. So for when you're formulating action plans, making sure that you're involving collaboration with social justice groups, but even non-social justice groups might actually be a critical component to achieving your goal. Yeah, and I'll add, I think when it comes to, um, Molly mentioned performative action, putting band-aids on situations isn't something that's gonna solve them. You have to, um, make a daily commitment to actively fight racism and put programs in place um, to fight racism. So um, I'm very proud of all the things that our campus has done. Um, com holding conversations like these and events like these is definitely a step in the right direction, but it's something you have to keep on doing. Um, doing a couple events here and there, um, it's it's good to spread awareness but it's something that has to keep happening and it's it's gonna have to keep going beyond this year beyond that year um just something that people are staying active in and making sure you're involving all students faculty and um staff members in the process i i agree with what paris said wholeheartedly and what everyone else is saying i i consider um, and I know this might be controversial, but I do consider race, uh, racist ideology as a mental illness philosophy, you know, and that, you know, like any school, we want to um, develop healthy, holistic minds, you know, and, and so I think it should be mandatory that all students take certain courses, have a, a certain type of passing grade, not a C, but a B plus or better. You know, this is, this is, because who are we allowing out into the public when they graduate with a BA or, you know, or a, a degree? I mean, who, who are they going to be intermingling with, you know, with this disease, right? This, this virus, this, an, this virus of racism. So I think it should be mandatory that every single year students have to pass these anti-racist courses and, um, Right, so they can, you know, evolve into healthy people, you know. I think that's such a great idea because students, you know, whether they realize it or not, as a student body, there's so much power there. And there's, there's just, if you go to these events and you bring that back to your peers, you're creating a movement. And all it takes is that one decision to say, you know what, 
I'm going to go to this event just because, not for a class, not because my friend's dragging me to it. I'm going to this event because I want to learn and I want to be a better person. Thank you, Lexi, Ocean, and our panelists. Uh, I just so much appreciate all of you uh, in this space and sharing. Um, and even behind the scenes, some of the comments between our panelists uh, around silos and intersectionality makes me so happy. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to open it up to um, a question uh, from our audience. Uh, Sean Mangan asks that, or says first and foremost, I love that the panel is women, uh, is women students. Do they feel they get enough support from men um, looking at students, faculty, or staff on campus? You say Dr. Logan earlier. Um, all I can think of. Well, uh, the, the, uh, ally, accomplice, and co-conspirator. Co-conspirator, right? Which you talked about earlier this morning for those that were part of the conversations. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for that question. Um, as Dr. Logan mentioned um, in the very beginning, um, this is intersectional. When, when you cross um, situations like this, you know, as a woman of color, um, I'm a woman, but I'm also a woman of color. And so when you, when you face situations, you can be facing racism, sexism, all in one. And to to look at one problem um, and ignore the other, you're, you're ignoring both problems, essentially. Um, so um, I, I just really think that it's important to look at both together. And um, I appreciate being here with all um, these lovely ladies as well. <laughs> yeah, I think when we look at kind of like we're defining intersectionality and kind of just for everyone listening what the ideas of it might be as a history nerd and myth, like mythological nerd it's almost like we're fighting hydra not like the marvel version but the many-headed beast and the fact is that if we cut off one of its heads it's just going to come back better than ever and more so i think when we look at um this panel and how we are all using the lens of that we all see the see this experience and our experience in the world through a female lens. Um, and I think that's definitely an interesting perspective. Uh, Sean, to more address your question when it relates to support on campus from uh, males, I believe that overall there are different experiences in which there have been positives and there have been negatives. And it's difficult to kind of address which one in particular. Um, because they're all so linked because I'm looking at a big hydra in front of me and I see yes there's one that says masculinity running around but there's also a really pressing matter of race class um, religion so many uh, sexuality so many different isms that are tied in with that so sorry if that doesn't really answer your question but <laughs> I feel like I usually see the same people that are you know participating in these conversations and um, you know, that are wanting to do the work, those are like the same people I see all the time. Um, and like, they know who they are and, you know, shout out to them. And I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, it would be really nice to see some new faces and see some more people's support. Um, I personally, you know, as a woman of color, I don't feel that supported by men on our campus. Um, not all men. I mean, like I mentioned, um, the people, you know, they know who they are. I, I appreciate them, but I don't feel that support from a lot of other people. And it, it, it might just be because, you know, um, we don't have that conversation openly on campus and I don't meet these people on a, on a daily basis or anything like that. But it would really be nice to see uh, that support from other people and just knowing that um, there are men out there that are talking about stuff that, you know, we're going through, not just as people of color, but as women as well. And um, there's definitely a space to do that. Um, we have open meetings sometimes at Women of Power. So if you want to come and have a conversation and learn a little bit more, um, if you identify as a man, you can join in one of our open meetings um, and we'll just make sure that that's like um, publicized more so you can participate. Going off of what Sabrina said, 
Yeah, as you can tell, I am a woman of color on campus. And like Molly said, there are instances where I do feel supported by men on campus and there are instances, instances when I don't. And um, Springfield is mo Springfield College is mostly like, there's mostly women or um, people who identify as female on campus. And whether you like it or not, males have a lot of power in the world. And even on campus, there's not as many males as there is as people who identify as females, but there are a lot of males and you guys have power, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not. So to actually see you in those leadership positions, fighting for other things, fighting for other injustices, other isms really makes a big difference and just go out there and fight for it. Like Sabrina said, there are a lot of males that I feel supported by, but it's usually the same ones that I see like doing other things too when there are a whole bunch of you that could actually step up and do something. You could step up, join a club, join Ben of Excellence or one of the power or something or like SSBD, which has both genders or sexuality, all sexuality. So like step up, be a leader, whether, yeah. Going off what Brianna is saying, um, this reminds me of a conversation I was having with a friend the other day, because um, I know that March is Women's History Month, and we've been seeing, or at least I've been seeing on my Instagram, social media, a lot of women posting resources, statistics about domestic violence, just all kinds of different women's issues. And I noticed that I don't see men on my Instagram posting those same things. So I, I just think it's important that men know that we, we do notice when you're not paying attention to the things that don't affect you. Um, and that's obviously, I don't mean to generalize all men because I knew, I know that um, there are men that are supporting and that are active in that. But it's just important to realize that, you know, by not saying anything, you're saying, you're saying a lot. I think too that it, it sort of intersects with other organizations on campus as well. Like I think of it as, you know, what if a, a strong male leader in the campus community showed up to like a GSA meeting. Like what would that mean for that group? It, it's another marginalized group on campus that suffers in the same way that could benefit so much from seeing just even the presence of more people, but particularly just, you know, strong like leaders, cisgender men that care and that are showing that they care and are there and provide themselves as a resource. It just means so much. So I can imagine it's the same way for, you know, anyone who on this campus who feels marginalized, just having that to be able to reach out and having that resource. It's just so, it's not even just professionally important, it's emotionally important for the individual. Thank you all for your comments. So, Jake um, is a person who aspires to fight for racial equality and civil rights in the legal field and is looking for advice from the panelists um, for his future aspirations. So, you know, what knowledge uh, would you share for someone um, entering the legal field and related occupations, um, especially given some of the, the majors uh, that are represented here? I, I, I would say um, check your bias, right? And become culturally competent, especially in the community you decide to work in so that you have a greater understanding of their culture and, um, and how they operate in the world, right? And so I would definitely suggest that. Sorry, Sabrina. <laughs> No worries. Um, yeah, I actually am studying sociology and English to go to law school for social justice as well. And I think the biggest thing is being able to understand um, things that you, you're not going to understand because of your own identity. Like, um, like if you're, I don't, I don't know, Jake, personally, but like if, if you're, you know, a white man and you want to fight for racial justice, then you need to be able to understand people of color. Um, you're never going to be able to fully understand something that you you don't um, personally identify with and that's okay but you know learning as much as you can as possible learning like the basics like stereotypes prejudice um, how to call those things out recognizing injustices recognizing you know institutional racism institutional injustices um, and being able to you know point those out and then work work towards those and i think the other thing too is surrounding yourself with as many people that are, you know, completely different from who you are, you learn from those around you the most. 
And I think just, you know, spending more time with people who um, don't have a similar background to yours is where you're definitely going to learn the most. Um, and then, you know, just taking whatever you learn from like reading, reading books about anti-racism and, um, you know, doing some, you know, some of the research on your own, because it is going to be a lot of work, but taking some of that into law school and um, also talking about that because um, the law in and of itself uh, is a racist institution. Um, so you need to be able to recognize that as well and point that out. Um, and if, as, as soon as you recognize that and you understand all the basic stuff that I was talking about in terms of like stereotypes, prejudice, and, you know, like institutional racism, things like that, you'll be able to help your, your clients and um, do what you want to do in a much more efficient manner. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I think, too, that, you know, especially in that field of work and, you know, you're fighting for racial equality and civil rights and it's it's such a great thing, but you have to approach each new case or each new situation with a clean new, like, slate because for every person, it looks different. Um, for every person, you know, they're, what they need, what they require for equity, it, it looks different for, you know, every group, every race. So that's something important to consider too, to just approach everything um, with an open mind. I think especially like just going off of exactly what Lexi and Sabrina was bringing up is just that law in particular is one of the major ways that we enforce systemic racism in the United States. And I think we see that through statistics, no matter whether you're like a quantitative learner or a qualitative learner, there have been so many studies that show just how systematically our judicial system impacts and um, hinders uh, different commu diverse communities. And I think that overall, it's not, necess it's not just the legal field. Um, for all of us that are on the panel today and for those that are listening, we all have different aspirations. Um, I plan to go into education and that's an equally as flawed system. It's the idea that we must like educate ourselves to understand why it's flawed and actively work every day to fight against that system of inherent racism. Thank you all uh, so much for sharing your uh, information or your knowledge or, or, or offering advice to Jake. So uh, someone did post um, in anonymous, anonymously um, the thought of, well, what's the difference between ally, accomplice, and co-conspirator? Um, so I'll put that out to you all. Um, what might be some differences in the terms? And sometimes uh, accomplice and co-conspirator can be used inter changeably, um, especially if we think, you know, since legal terms and ramifications when there's an accomplice or co-conspirator, but what would be the, um, the difference between an ally and someone who's an accomplice or co-conspirator? Well, a co-conspirator is, is someone who, you know, is by your side actively doing the work with you. Um, I, guess, I guess an example would be, you know, if I'm trying to create some sort of conversation about, you know, race on campus or whatever the case may be, and I need, um, I need someone to be a part of that conversation and, you know, someone comes, someone not only, you know, volunteers to be a part of that conversation, but get, tries to get other people to be a part of that conversation, tries to do as much work as possible to keep the conversation going, you know, so that the work is not just all on me. Um, I think that that would probably be a good example of a co-conspirator. And I guess, I guess the thing that comes to mind when I think of an ally is that, yes, they support your cause, but it, it's just not, I feel like they're not putting in as much effort or doing as much steps as they should. Um, and I, that's not to say that, you know, if you're an ally, you're a bad person or anything like that, but it's taking it a step further. You know, it's not about like just posting a black square on Instagram because, you know, you support Black Lives Matter. Like what what else are you going to do? You know what I mean? Um, so I, I, I for me, like, I think that there's, there's different tiers. And I feel like allies closer to the bottom and co-conspirators is like right up there, you know, with the people that are doing the work themselves. It shouldn't 
the weight and the burden shouldn't be on people of color alone. Yes, you know, this is something that they experience, but just because we experience it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's not just our problem. It doesn't mean that we have to carry the weight on our shoulders. And people who choose to stay at the bottom as an ally, you know, are kind of making it harder for us, in my opinion. I'll offer just one example. So there was a panel discussion earlier today on John Brown. You know, when we consider the life and actions and not saying that anyone needs to uh, offer uh, their life, literally, um, but he certainly is an example or uh, of, you know, an accomplice, a co-conspirator um, to the degree that, you know, he did, he did lose his life, but you know, that's not necessarily for what folks are asking for when seeking for co-conspirators and for our accomplice. Dr. Logan, I'm having a problem with the mute button over here. Um, I also added a resource um, for anyone and as an extra resource on uh, ally and accomplice. Um, I have the privilege of asking the next question from our uh, friend, Jillian Powers. Um, here's Jillian's question. Hi there, ladies. How can we use our anger to fuel anti-racist efforts on campus when our attempts feel futile? We are tired and angry. How do we approach these subjects without feeling like we're walking on eggshells? For BIPOC and women, it can be an unsafe situation to address with people, especially white men. Um, I can take this question. So if anyone knows me, knows I get mad about a lot of things, but then I also back it up with like a lot of action too. So that goes along with being an ally or being an accomplice. It's like the actions that you do. So if you're, you're angry, but then how are you going to fuel that? So you could have an initiative, have an event, have a program or whatever, put out some resources so that people could educate themselves in that. So like a, one, at least have one person would change one person's mind and then that person could change another person's mind and so on and so forth. So there's always that. You won't see it change right away, but knowing that you did something and that it might affect someone down the line is a huge relief. And then you're, I know for me, I always feel accomplished when I know I changed someone. So then it helped them no matter their situation. And the other part of your question, to feel like you're not walking on eggshells, just take the problem head on. And yeah, it could be an unsafe situation, but I think to know who you're actually talking to, know who you're dealing with, and if you don't feel safe to have that conversation with that person, then it's okay, don't have it, because at the end of the day, you don't wanna like, put, there's some people that wanna put their life on the line for it, and that's okay, but not everyone wants to, and that's completely fine too or you could find someone to have that conversation with them that's better equipped to have it, if you understand what I'm saying. So make sure you feel safe in every single situation, no matter the conversation, that is the number one. And make sure your initiatives are driven by purpose and by passion, because if they aren't driven by purpose or passion, then what is the point of doing anything? I hope that is part of your question. I also feel like being tired and angry is a symptom when you're dealing with people who are disingenuous about having conversations and actually taking actions. And so you get tired and angry because the person doesn't actually want to learn or be better or do something different. They just wanna argue for the sake of arguing or make you angry. So I think really recognizing those people and not at spending all of your energy into them and wasting your energy um, by giving them that anger and actually using that as fuel to actually work with people who are genuine, who actually want to learn and do better and be better. That's what makes it less tiring and less angry. Uh, I think the important thing is that like, unfortunately, you know, this is a hard conversation to have because some people aren't ready to hear 
you know, the truth. Some people aren't ready to hear people's experiences. Um, but I don't, I personally don't feel like I have to walk on eggshells because this is my experience and I don't want to have this experience. I don't want other people after me to have this experience. And I feel like I shouldn't be the one walking on eggshells because I deserve change. Everyone, you know, who identifies as BIPOC deserves change. Anyone from any minority group deserves change. I think that, you know, people need to stop walking on eggshells and pretending like, you know, like, if I if I say something that you know I experienced, you you can't get upset and you can't say that I hurt your feelings because I experienced a racist you know situation on campus and now you feel you have to walk around on eggshells like this this is reality like the the world is a real place and it's a hard place to navigate and I think that walking on eggshells doesn't get us anywhere and then it it continues to fuel this anger and I think you know and I think the most important thing is you recognize that you have a passion for this and you you keep putting that energy into making change. I don't think you should ever um, make change based on feelings of anger. I feel like that that doesn't really get you anywhere. I feel like you can be frustrated, you can feel upset because I've, I've definitely been there. Um, but I think that if I went into a situation trying to make, navigate change on campus or wherever I want to navigate change and I used my anger as a motivation, it would just get me nowhere. I need to focus more on, you know, like what's what's the important outcome for me and how do I use that to fuel, you know, whatever whatever um, motive it is that I'm trying to navigate. Um, but I, I think the, the, the moral of the story is never use anger as a motivator in terms of going to fight for change because it'll, it will backfire in your face. You just remember that you care about this and this is what you have to do. And, you know, sometimes you're going to fall down before you can actually get to where you need to be. Um, and also remember that, you know, you don't have to walk on eggshells if you feel like if you truly care about something, you don't have to walk on eggshells. Um, you know, there's going to be people who disagree with you. There's going to be people who feel like they have to walk on eggshells, um, but you need to do what's what's best and what's comfortable for you. I think that's a really good point, Sabrina. And I think it's just at the end of the day, our most productive conversations come from people who both have a vested interest in making things better. So recognizing when somebody doesn't have that interest and trying as hard as it is, trying not to engage with that because it's just gonna wear your energy down and that's not fair to you. Um, and so just, it's important, you know, having both people be invested in the conversation for the right reasons. Thank you all for responding to that. So another attendee would like to know um, a little bit more about campus climate, specifically, how are you all um, dealing with the burden of doing anti-racism work um, on campus? Has it taken a toll on you in some way, shape or form? Yes, yes, <laughs> it, it definitely has, I mean, I, for those of you who don't know, student trustee elect like president, woman of power, participate um, as much as I can and like all the other clubs that, you know, support anti-racist work. And it's, it is very tiring seeing the same people, you know, advocating for me on a consistent basis. We need more people, we need new people, we need, we need more effort from other people. It can't just be, you know, the BIPOC students doing all this work. It's very frustrating, you know, having a conversation or hosting a meeting and then it's like the same 20 people coming and like like these people already know like these people already care about the stuff like we need more people to care it's it feels frustrating it feels like you have the weight of the entire earth on your shoulders trying to figure out how to keep this conversation going and how to actually feel like you're being how and actually having to be heard i feel like and it's definitely taken a toll on me personally because I'm surrounded by, you know, this negativity of, of racism on a consistent basis because I have to keep talking about it if I want to get anywhere. And I, I think, you know, constantly talking about my own traumas and my own issues and, you know, things that I'm afraid of facing because I'm a person of color later on, it's just a constant reminder. And then you keep thinking about it and you can't get away from that type of stuff. And I feel like you know, it would be nice if, you know, other people took that burden on themselves and upon themselves to actually have that conversation. I mean, the work that we do is important and that's why I keep doing it, but it, it is taking a, a toll on my mental health and to the point where I feel like I can't think about or talk about anything other than, you know, my own experiences as a person of color. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just really hard and 
I wish more people would listen and I wish more people were stepping out of being an ally and moving more towards being a co-conspirator. Uh, co-conspirator. Um, it's not just about posting stuff on social media. It's not just about being at a march because you think that that's the best thing. Like, no, like there's hard work that goes into doing this type of work and to getting to where we need to be and posting a black square on your social media page doesn't do anything for me at the end of the day. It doesn't solve my problem. It doesn't help at all. I, go ahead. You can go, Ocean. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Sabrina and I absolutely re resonate with her. Um, it does take a toll. However, I love channeling my frustration, you know, just meditate and then do the work that needs to be done. But I, again, I do, I, I still do believe that this college is responsible for making these type of workshops mandatory, mandatory, not just voluntary to come. I, it has to be, you know, people, some, you know, a lot of people don't understand that their biases, they don't understand that they have biases. They don't understand that some of these people don't understand that they are racist and, you know, biases and racism is a deadly, deadly state of mind. It causes death, right? It causes destruction. It causes many people to end up in prison because of the systems, right? The policies that are, you know, all these people are supposed to be progressive people, but, you know, but, but then again, they write these policies that are anti-life, right? Anti-BIPOC people, right? Anti-people who are poor, right? So, so it should be mandatory. And if you understand that, if you understand that millions of people go every day with their biases unchecked, then you have to make these type of workshops mandatory. You can't expect the unknown to know something without, you know, without, you, you got to make the change. So I think it really needs to not only come from the bottom up, which we, I consider us the bottom, you know, but it has to come from the top. You have to make these type of workshops um, mandatory. So we, the ones that do show up all the time, aren't the ones that are always left alone to do, you know, all the work. Uh, going back to Sabrina's point, yeah, it is tiring doing these work, doing all this work and being having the same like 20 people in the room. So it is up to other people on campus, like whether you see it or not, you have power, like being a student and going out into the real world. And something that I worry about, and I know some of my peers also worry about is is this work going to be done when we graduate? Like, are we going to be moving backwards? Because the point of this work is so we could move forward, so it could be better. So if we have children that are legacy that come to this school, they could see how much better it is and that they don't have to constantly be dealing with the world of racism or other isms. So it's up to other students to actually be willing to do this work because whether you see it or not, you have power in everything you do. So come to the meetings, come to the programs that are being offered to you because they're free to you. So why don't you come educate yourself, educate your friends, encourage all your friends to come. Because like, we aren't the only ones doing this work. We're trying to stop the racism. So it's up to you to actually learn and educate yourself to know how you're causing racism or other isms. And I think going off of that, <clears throat> sorry, I think going off of that is that from this pandemic, we're all feeling exhausted from some way or another. But it's the idea that I will never have the burden that every that other members on this panel have, because I'm white and I'm white on Springfield College's campus. I'm white in my daily life. And I therefore have less of a burden. But that just makes me more responsible to be uncomfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable and that we need to take on an active role um, to educate ourselves, to show up, and to ease the burden of everyone else, because we're a community. If we're gonna pitch this at Springfield College, that we are the community that we say we are, it's time to lessen the burden on everyone else. Yeah, and I'd just like to reiterate that um, when it comes to activism on campus, we are students first. So to how to be a student in a pandemic, on top of racism and trying to find programming in our clubs institutionally, it can be exhausting. I know, I know we're all burnt out from zooming in and doing all this work for our classes. So just, just imagine the work of 
planning events and reaching out to staff and faculty and trying to fix this issue and that issue on top of everything we have going on. It's, it's completely exhausting, but because it's something that we're passionate about and something that we see um, that can make the future better for not just us, but students of color in the future, it's important work for us to do. And when we plan, I'm, I'm so happy to see so many people here today, but when we have club meetings or when we plan events and people don't show up, it, it can sometimes feel a little bit defeating. Like uh, we did all the right things, but the message is not getting out to people. So um, just like everyone's been saying, make sure you always bring in your friends. You have to make it a personal responsibility to want to learn about these issues and to put yourself in a position where you're knowledgeable to help fight these issues. Yeah, I think Paris said it well, like, I mean, we're, we're definitely all going through stuff, but, you know, our identity adds to our struggle. And I think that, you know, the fact that we're the ones carrying the weight of this problem is what really makes it hard. Um, and like Brianna was saying, you know, like next year I'll be student trustee, but I, I'm already worried about, you know, like when I graduate, like who's going to keep doing this work? and trying to find someone who is going to keep this conversation going. And, you know, it's not just like, all right, I got to, I have to do my homework and I got to go to class and that's it. No, I have to do my homework. I have to go to class. I have to go to five meetings. I have to do my, I have to host my own meeting. I have to meet with the president's leadership team. I have to be on these committees. I have to bring stuff to these committees. I have to constantly keep the ball rolling. And it's not, it's not just like, okay, I can go on three Zooms, do my homework and I'm done for the day. Like, no, like I don't, I feel like this problem in addition to, you know, being in the middle of a pandemic and stuff has stripped me of a social life because this, this is what my time revolves around having to plan these conversations because I feel like if I don't do it or if, you know, my friends who are volunteering to do the work can't make it and none of us can do it, then who's going to do it for us? Because we haven't seen anyone else, you know, lifting the weight for us. Did you want to say something? I'll I was just going to say that um, I feel like I can really relate to that as far as the GSA goes, because I know it's so hard. And I, I this entire time, I'm just thinking about also the intersectionality of members in the GSA who are also BIPOC. And my heart just breaks because it's just there's so little support for these groups on campus. And it, there just needs to be more presence for these folks. Thanks, Lexi. That actually helps to lead into one of the questions uh, that we got from our pan, uh, from our attendees. And that question is, what does intersectional feminism mean to the board or to this group of folks? I'll start off with this one. Um, so when we think about intersectionality and feminism, you know, I don't, for example, I don't just exist as a woman. I am a white woman. I'm a bisexual woman. I have all these other identities going on within me. And so knowing, um, how I have a certain privilege as being a white woman, um, how that affects me versus how BIPOC women are experiencing being a woman. That's a very different thing. So I think just, you know, there's all these complexities and there's depth to who we are and who our identities are. And some of these identities you can see right away when you see a person, like you, I'm white, but some of them you don't. And so I think that, um, and if, I guess a point I want to bring up, if anybody knows who Kimberly Crenshaw is, she has really great, great TED Talks about this. Um, I watched it in Felicia's class. It was a great conversation about that. So I think that that's definitely a great idea. If something, if intersectional, if intersectionality is something that's new to you, I think that's a really great way to introduce yourself to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just about uncovering these different identities and knowing how my privilege in one aspect can help um, bring up people in another in another identity group. Um, I also want to add, uh, last year, I think in Women's Tea, there was a saying, don't just support your cisgendered sister, also support all your sisters. So whether they be non-binary or part of the LGBTQ plus community, 
always support them because intersectionality is literally everywhere and it's up to you to actually find out how you could support those individuals whether they be part of the um, lgbtq plus community whether they be part of the bipoc community or all these other communities ask them how i could better support you because at the end of the day they're the ones going to be living in silence with your hatred or your ignorance or whatever it is so it's up to you to make them feel comfortable so for me feminism is the idea that we are trying to fight for equality for women so when you bring in that intersectionality piece and I know this isn't something that we've mentioned yet, but I'm a person who does not have a disability. So when I'm fighting for women's rights, am I even thinking about women who have disabilities? And that's something that I've been recognizing in myself is I have um, areas of oppression within me, even being a woman of color um, that I need to address to make sure that I'm assisting and helping everyone and not just myself. Yeah, I know there's, there's that saying that if your feminism intersec isn't intersectional, then it's not feminism, because feminism is for all women. And if you identify as a woman, then you deserve feminism. So if you're fighting for, for white feminism only, or for um, black feminism only, then it's not feminism, because feminism is all inclusive. It, it, I, it represents everyone who identifies as a woman, who identifies as a woman. And I also think that when we're talking about feminism, sometimes it's considered just this F word, right? This idea that we should kind of sway away from even saying that, hey, I'm a feminist, because it comes along with this stigma of maybe being a man hater. Um, and I really just, I hate that. <laughs> I don't hate a lot of things. I hate that, that the idea that feminism is the act of putting down those that identify as male. That's really not the case. And I think Paris, you just hit on it exactly that feminism, the whole point of feminism is to be intersectional, is to cover class divisions, is to cover religious divisions, is to cover sexuality divisions, anything, race, anything, any one of the isms that we've looked at ableism, anything that we've seen, it's to cover that and to support. And I think that when we see feminism, we might just assume that males are left out of the equation, but they're not. And no one should be left out of the equation um, when we're coming, when we're trying to fight oppression. And I think that feminism for me means that we are, we need to work together to alleviate burdens that we see in our society that are ingrained, but it doesn't just rely on those that identify as women. Yeah, sorry to chime back in, but um, Molly just <laughs> reminded me of something really important. So when you think of feminism, it's not anti-man. And, and to relate this to the conversations on race, um, just to throw that out there, Black Lives Matter does not mean that anyone else's life does not matter. So when you, so when you say all lives matter, it's kind of a protest to our protests. Like when people say, um, clear the oceans, we don't want plastic in our oceans to save the turtles, you're not saying, well, what about the dolphins? Because it's, it's as much as it's about the dolphins, it's about the turtles. So if you can empathize with turtles, then you should be able to empathize with human beings. And, and where our attention needs to be is where the problems are. So I think that steering the attention away from the issue is trying to ignore it and eventually just perpetuates the issue. So our focus needs to be where the issues are. And I would also add to what Paris just said too, and then to extend that further, it's also like when people say, you know, you know, I'm white, I'm not white, I'm African American and Native American, but when white people say, you know, well, you know, we have struggles too. And I just say, well, your struggles aren't based on your skin color. And that's the difference, right? Is that you have white skin privilege. We don't, you know, and that's, that's really is like black lives matter is like black lives matter too. Not that all lives don't matter, but black lives matter too. Thank you all so much for um, your 
conversation around intersectional or intersectionality, um, specifically in connection with feminism. So we're slowly, slowly approaching our end time. And so, you know, let's sort of shift the conversation to how we keep this conversation and necessary associated actions moving through the summer and into the fall and beyond. So what are some thoughts about keeping the conversation and fruitful action? Definitely want to emphasize that for um, moving forward. I think that no matter who you are, when you see a speaker coming on the campus to talk about race, to talk about any kind of minority group, go. If there's a diversity club hosting an event, go. Change needs to happen starting with the decisions that we make as students. And this community honestly is comprised of some of the most incredible people I think I will ever know. And I know that we can all make a difference and confront racism on campus and all isms and beyond. And that's really what this is about because this, this generation has power and it has the power to change the world. And it starts now, it starts as we're building you know, who we are as an adult, as a person in society. So if you strive to learn and to strive to be uncomfortable, that's how you're going to grow and how you will always grow and always be, you know, advancing as a person. I think for me, I'm a very I got to plan everything out. So if I were to give someone advice that was similar to me, if your goal is to continue the action um, and com conversations on campus, make that a goal and then write down the steps that you need to achieve that goal. So if it's taking a class that we offer at Springfield College, if it is attending a club organization meeting, and then what are the actual actions that you're going to follow through on? Are you going to write a letter to your congressperson? Are you going to talk to your family member? Are you going to um, make friends with new people that you've never met? Are you going to try to learn a language so you can communicate with other people? Those are some things. It doesn't have to always be really big, but they're little steps that help you keep achieving that overall goal. Um, I really appreciated the conversations on race that we held um, prior to our fall semester. And I think that's something that we should continue keep on to keep on having those um, constructive conversations on race. And um, I know that people have plans in the summer, but um, away from school, we have more free time. And whatever you prioritize in that free time, that's what you're going to show up at. And if you say that fighting racial injustice is your priority, then you should make it known that is your priority. You should show up when there's opportunities like this to participate. Um, and, and like we keep on saying, invite your friends, include them in the process. But um, just be a co-conspirator, as we've been saying. Um, your actions and your words have to line up. I think that's uh, the, para the point that Paris brought up is really important of prioritizing it. And I think that white people on this campus coming from a white person myself, this isn't something we necessarily have to think about all the time because it's not our lived experience. But you really need to make yourself think about these things and make it a priority. It's just taking that extra effort of putting that first instead of doing the other things that you want to be doing. Because, you know, we don't have that burden. So we need to help. We need to help our people of color on campus. We need to help our fellow students. We need to really put them first because at the end of the day, it benefits everybody. It's not, it's not something that will just benefit people of color. It's really important to the community as a whole. Yeah, like it was said earlier, you know, attend attend the meetings, get get to know us more, get to understand where, you know, our struggles are, get to understand how this work comes about. Cause you know, the stuff that we try to do doesn't just fall out of thin air. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And we don't meet with faculty that help to help us do all this stuff. The majority of the time we're students putting this work together on our own. Um, we're meeting on our own time, on our free time to talk about this type of stuff. Um, and, you know, just, just come and learn more about what it is that we're doing. Just stay active, you know, just because summer is rolling around the corner. Definitely enjoy your summer, but, you know, when we come back in the fall, um, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're going to keep having this conversation. And it also shouldn't be a fear of other people's of whether or not we're going to have this conversation.
Oh, I just want to address one question real quick. I know we're we're pretty much wrapping up, but someone said, you know, what 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 should we recommend for them if they don't spend a lot of time with people of color in there at Springfield? I hope I reiterated that right. You know, just branch branch out and meet new people. Um, you know, you shouldn't have to be worried about meeting somebody because they're you know a, a person of a different skin tone. You know, you you could have this could be your next best friend, and you have no idea because you're too worried about whether or not you'll you'll be anything like them because you don't you don't look like them physically um and i think that that's the thing that you know keeps a lot of barriers between a lot of a lot of people is that people are more worried about whether or not they're going to relate to each other on the outside but it it's not just the outside that makes a person it's the inside as well and there's there's a lot about a person that you're never going to know if you're judging them based off of their race or based off of you know their um you know whatever they're a part of so i think it's it's just a matter of you know if you're if you even are an extroverted person because i know i'm not that extroverted i i'm usually forced into meeting new people but it ends up working out so i think that if you're an extroverted person you know just start having start having those conversations start joining clubs because that's how you meet people start you know having the conversation with people on a sports team if you're on a sports team you know um you're bound to find someone who you want to be friends with um you know, for the right reasons. Don't be friends with someone who's, you know, a minority just because you want them to be like an excuse for whatever. You know, be with, be friends with someone for a genuine reason. Um, and that's pretty much it. To follow up with Sabrina's uh, uh, comment too, um, one of the questions in the chat was about classes. And I would say suggest two classes that we currently offer at Springfield College. The first is the Foundations of Multicultural Ed, which both Dr. Logan and I teach. Uh, and the second one is the anti-racism course that was just cultivated this year. And so for those that aren't aware, now you're aware, so you can engage in one of those two classes. I would also recommend um, racial and ethnic relations. That's what got me to switch my major from psychology to sociology. And for those of you who don't know, sociology is pretty much the study of um, social relationships and how we all interact with one another. And um, that's pretty much what I'm studying because I want to fight for social change and social justice and I need to know how we all interact with each other and how society works as a whole and you can learn a lot in just as one class you can learn a lot in just intro. Um, so I would recommend pretty much any sociology class if you could take it. Um, a new class that's offered this semester is called Deconstructing Racism. It's a part of a bigger initiative. It's a one credit class, and that is such an amazing class. There's all white students in my class. I'm the only black person, so there's that. But the teacher is really engaging. Everyone is just willing to learn. If you could take that class next year, next semester, and years to come, that is a really great class. And I know in most of my criminal justice classes, we talk about race and um, the crime disparities and the social justice disparities associated with that. I will, I will add from the faculty perspective that it is not about a foundations of multicultural class. It's not about just the field of sociology or criminology, that this is work that impacts every single professional program, um, liberal arts program on this campus. So there is a responsibility for all faculty to have to possess the necessary knowledge, skills, and dispositions to have these conversations in the sciences, how in math, um, in the health sciences, as well as any other course where it uh, or a pro program where it may seem a natural fit. It is a responsibility of of all of us. So with that, we are at 355 and I want everyone just to do one thing real quickly before we leave. I want you to put one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly. So sit up nice and tall, put one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly and you can keep your eyes open or you can go ahead and let them close. And I want you to take a deep breath in, fill your belly up, let that belly Feel and feel and just stretch that hand. And I want you to exhale. I want you to take another deep breath in, filling your belly up. Let your chest lift and exhale. And one more time, deep breath in, fill that belly with air, fill up some more, let the chest lift and exhale. I wish you all a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Have a great day.
Thank you so much, panelists. Um, Ibram Kendi is this evening. Dr. Hill has joined us on camera. You need to say anything else? All right. Well, I just want to congratulate this panel. It was an absolutely amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your vulnerability. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and I just so appreciate your candor. Uh, and this has been a wonderful day. Um, as we alluded to earlier today, uh, Dr. Cooper shared with me that this is going to be something that we're going to do every year. Uh, so thank you so much. I hope that we can continue this conversation uh, for our legacy alumni that are out there. Uh, thank you for bringing this back to us. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, this was something that was promised 50 years ago. Uh, and while we may be late, uh, we are getting it done. So uh, thank you so much to everyone. And I wish you all a fantastic rest of the evening. And we'll see you all this evening as we uh, listen to Ibram Kendi. Take care, everyone.